And we now move on to the third presentation by Reverend Father George Kulangara, CMI, who is currently the rector at Darshana Institute of Philosophy in Vartha, Maharashtra. Father George will speak to us on our call to be prophets in the church. Our call to be prophets in the church. Father George is one of our best philosophy professors in the congregation. An excellent formator he is. And Father George also is known for his authentic, consecrated life. With these few words of introduction, may I now request Father George to speak to us on our call to be prophets in the church. Father George, over to you. Thank you very much, dear Reverend Father Saji, for those uh, kind words. Dear Reverend Major Superiors, Reverend Fathers, Sisters and brothers, am I sufficiently audible to you all? Yes, Father George, please proceed. Thank you, thank you very much. It's indeed a great privilege and pleasure for me to be reflecting with you all on our call to be prophets in the church. I thought I'll begin with one of my experiences that I had years back. During my time as a seminarian, and uh, a student of philosophy way back in 1990. My provincial superior sent me, asked me to go to Rishikesh and spent about 10 days in one of those Hindu ashrams, uh, to be specific, Shivananda ashram. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Rishikesh, Rishikesh is a place where everything one sees, everything one hears, Everything one feels and smells is of Hindu spirituality and religion on the bank of river, sacred river, Ganga. So I was there. And uh, it's, a large, it's one of the largest ashrams there. And it's Abbot, the Acharya, was a very holy man, much respected, much revered holy man. And we were told that every day at 2.30, he would give a public audience. So those of us who are interested may go and uh, stay here. So one day I thought, I'll go and see how this man looked like. So I was there and I was part of a group about, of about 30, 35 people of all, a mix of all sorts, old and young, men and women, educated and uh, illiterate, rich and poor. We were all squatting on the floor, on the corridor. And exactly at uh, 2.30, this reverend man, old man, in saffron clothes, came out. And then he sat on a stool. He did not give a lecture, not a talk, nothing, no exhortation. He was just engaging in simple chit-chat, simple conversation of uh, simple things of life, weather, food, etc., etc., etc. I didn't want to be noticed, so I took my place right at the back in a corner. But then to my embarrassment, he spotted me and asked me where I was from. He was speaking in Hindi, and I said, I was from Bangalore. Why, where, what, what are you doing in Bangalore, he asked. I said, I'm doing philosophy, I'm a student of philosophy. Why philosophy, he asked. I didn't have an answer. And I did not want to say that I was a seminarian. Precisely because, not because I was ashamed to be a seminarian, but I thought he would not understand what it means to be a seminarian. But since I had no other, nothing else to say, I said, I'm a seminarian. Then to my great surprise, he shifted to English and asked me, are you a religious or a diocesan? I said, I'm a religious. Which order, he asked. I said, I'm a Carmelite. My dear friends, then for the next 15 to 20 minutes, in simple Hindi, he spoke. Not to me, but to the group there. He was explaining to them the Carmelite spirituality. Referring to the great saint, great mystical saint, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. Referring to their classics, 
the ascent of the Mount Carmel, the interior castle, and so on. To be very honest, I hadn't read those books then. This image, this experience has remained stuck in my mind ever since. And I keep asking myself, who was the Catholic then? Was I the Catholic or was he the Catholic then? At least he had the Catholic attitude in his mind, in his heart, in his life. And I said this, I shared this with you all now because I thought this tells us as to what we should be today and much of what is wrong with us today. I have the privilege of traveling a lot all over India, especially in the North. And it's my conviction that Christ is, even today, Christ is accept, acceptable to practically everyone in India, everyone in our society. And there was a time that the church and its, and its institutions were loved, respected, and defended by people, more so by the people outside the church. But today, time is changing. Things are changing. We experience it every day. Today, our own people make a clear distinction between Christ and church. And people in the church make clear distinction between church as such and the hierarchical, hierarchical church that includes we the consecrated people and the clergy. And for many people, and I think their number is growing, for many people, we identify, the, the hierarchical church is identified with money, power, privilege, luxury, greed, and everything evil. We can protest, and we do that. We can say, we can say that we are not the villains. The media is the villain, or the, the anti-Christian elements are the villains. But I think on an honest self-examination, we will have to acknowledge that there is truth in much of their accusations about us. It is in this context that we need to understand our prophetic call in the church. We consecrated people. We have a prophetic call. And that is what gives us a distinct identity in the church. But here again, there is a problem. One of the trends, one of the prominent trends we see is including, I mean, involving us, is that we compete. We compete with the church to become a parallel church. And that is one of the accusations made about us. Again and again, we become, we function almost like a parallel church. Another trend is we bargain, we bargain for a share in the privilege and in the power of the church. We fight for, we bargain and fight for spoils of power and privilege. When we do that, I think we forget our call to be prophets in the church. Our call is to be the salt in the church, salt of the church. We lament, many of us lament that the church has got deteriorated. The church has become corrupt. Church is degenerate. May be true, but then what is more true is before the church did, we, the consecrated people, became corrupt. We, the consecrated people, degenerated. We forgot our prophetic call. And the church is feel church is only reaping, harvesting the, 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 the misfortune that we have sowed. We need to on the responsibility, much of the responsibility. Now, what, what's our way ahead? I think the way ahead is in discernment. We need to discern what is right with us, what should be right with us, and what is now 
wrong with this? I will, in this context, I will share a few scattered points. There is, we need to, we need to understand, we need to realize that religion is not spirituality. Religion need not be spiritual. Religion is one thing, spirituality is something else. We are called not to be people of religion. We are called to be people of spirituality. There is a clear distinction, there is a clear difference between spirituality and ritualism. See what is happening today. There is an increasing dose of ritualism within the church. Too much of prayer, too much of spiritual exercise. Are we becoming better Christians with this? Think of the times, centuries back, for many, many, many centuries, maybe until a century, until, a few, until 50 years back, until 60 years back, our people, our forefathers, our forefathers lived without a Bible, lived without daily holy mass, daily lived without many of the rituals we have today. And still, they preserved the saltness within the church. They kept the church as salt of the earth and light of the world. Now we have an abundance of rituals. We have an abundant access, easy access to scripture. But have we become better? I think it is in our time that the church became corrupt as it is now. We need to see, we need to realize that our emphasis, our overemphasis is on ritualism. And we think we live in the illusion that being ritualistic by saying our prayers, by having a series of community prayers, we are spiritual people. In fact, we may not be. Our call, second point, our call is to be disciples. Our call is to be disciples, not to be devotees. It is very easy to be devotees. Devotee is, devotee lives his, his or her identity in the church. And outside the church, she is like anybody else in the world. On the other hand, if we are disciples, we live the mind of Jesus incarnated in our life, in our contact, in our thoughts, in our responses. It is hard to be a disciple. If I am a disciple of Christ, then I become a spiritual person. To be spiritual means to bear, to produce the fruits of this world which St. Paul lists out in Galatians chapter 5. Love, peace, joy, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Is, is there anything unique about, is there anything unique about them as Christian? Love is not anything specifically Christian, it's spiritual. We are, we do not have the monopoly of these, Christians do not have any monopoly over these fruits of the spirit. If I'm a really spiritual person, I will feel at home with anyone. Then I will not minister to the church. I will not live and I will not be known as a minister of the church. Rather, if I'm a spiritual person, I will live and I will be known as a minister of the kingdom of God. And I think that was the mind of Christ. Jesus did not preach the church. He preached. So he preached and lived the kingdom of God, in which everyone, even the worst sinner, had a role, a dignified role. Today, sadly, we become people of a sect. We become people of a denomination. And we become defenders of our own sect and denomination. With this, we keep, we push a lot of people who are for Christ. We push them out and we push them away from Christ as well. We fail in our prophetic role in the church. Many people are fascinated to hear, to say that we, have, we are prophets. For many people, this is, there's a lot of heroism involved in this. But then again, there's a problem in living our prophetic role. Because for many people, 
To be a prophet means is to fight. Yes, we need to fight. But fight should be against sin. But again, one of the growing trends we see today is the fight against sin soon becomes degenerated as a fight against sinners. And sinner could be my bishop, the sinner could be my provincial, the sinner could be my superior, the sinner could be uh, a politician, the sinner could be a man from another denomination or people of other denominations and religions. We again fail to be Christian. We fail to lift the mind of Christ. Jesus did not fight any sinner. Rather, what we see in the gospel is everyone, especially the people in the margins, people, the margins of grace, sinful people, they felt completely at home with Jesus because he was the prophet of the kingdom of God, not of the church. This is why I refer to that my experience in Rishikesh. I thought he was a man of the kingdom of God. Everyone, even me as a Catholic, even me as a seminarian, even me as a Catholic religious felt very much at home in his presence. I think that is our call. Today, if we push people away from us because of our, by living our identity as religious and Catholic, religious, our identity as a religious and as a Catholic, then we do not understand what it means to be a Catholic. We do not understand what it means to be a religious, a consecrated person, a consecrated person in the church. Because we fail in this, we feel that there is something missing in our life. And we feel a gap. We feel, uh, we feel a hollowness. And we try to feel that. We feel the pinch of guilt. And so I think this is the reason why we build institutions after institutions. And we con conduct, conduct programs, organize programs after programs. And we, we remain in a permanent state of seeing us. We remain all the time busy. We are always busy because we want to forget, we want to push aside that feel of the pinch of guilt coming from within. Because we know I do not live credibility as a disciple of Jesus. In fact, our institutions should draw credibility from my life as a disciple of Jesus. Today, with the trend, growing trend is that we draw credibility for our life from our institutions. And people see it. People see it. And people see us as empty people. People empty within. Very few people. Now the number is increasing. People do not see us as spiritual people anymore. I'm not saying that all of us are like that, but the growing trend is, at least in people's perception, popular perception, we, are, we become less and less spiritual people. We become people of institutions. We become people of organizations, etc. This is the standard today. Religious life is becoming a standard. I'm in the field of formation, and this is what I have to lift my own students. They feel that we are becoming less and less credible. Religious life is losing its credibility. It's becoming, a scandal, growingly becoming a scandal. It's, religious life is becoming a scandal, not because a few of us fall to the temptation of sexual misconduct or financial misconduct. They are human weaknesses. Such cases have always been there. The scandal today, the scandal of a scandal in the religious, religious life today is that we, we, we live a very mediocre life as people of institutions, people running institutions, conducting programs, doing this and that, and less and less living life of the spirit.
my dear friends, I'm concluding. This is our call. We need to return to our call as prophets in the church. Call is just this. We need to slow down. We need to slow down. We do not have to convince anybody else. We need to make, I need to make religious life convincing to myself today. That's my greatest challenge. Day in and day out, I need to make my religious life convincing to myself. This I can do not by building up bigger institutions. Rather, I need to return to my spiritual roots. Thank you. God bless us all.